Welcome to Going Carnivore in Thailand. Now, I want to thank my user 604 Nation because they had asked the question on a previous video, how did you go from 190 to 380 pounds? What was the story? Well, that got me thinking, and I decided to work on reconstructing my memory over time on all the trials and tribulations, along with some associated stories of what transpired from 1977 when I was 22 years old to present day. So let's get to it with this episode. All right, let's spin back the time machine. It's 1977. I'm 22 years old. At the time, I am now running a scale company called Acme Scale Service. That was in Cincinnati, Ohio. The company, it specialized in fixing industrial weighing equipment. And I knew exactly how much I weighed back then because since we tested scales in industrial plants, I used to have to carry all these weights and I would have to unload them out of the truck and put them on a cart and push them all through these huge plants that sometimes cover blocks quarter, quarter mile long, sometimes half mile long, some of these bigger plants that produce chemicals or they produce cars or parts for cars. Well, one of the things that you end up doing is after you get one scale calibrated correctly by putting 50 pound weights on and noting where the weights are and that sort of thing, you learn that when you go to the next scale, sometimes you just weigh yourself right off the bat, see how close it is. Because if you fix the first scale and then you weighed yourself and you were 190 pounds, when you went to a second scale, well, you could stand on it. You'd know if it was close or not, or if they had an immediate problem. If it said 170, well, you knew the scale was dirty underneath. Well, this goes back to the situation of scales were hard work because back in the old days, you had scales with big dials on them. They weren't electronic. They had this indicator, and the, the indicator would, would go around the dial like that, and uh, it would stop on 190 pounds or 150 pounds, whatever was on the scale. And you used to have to take and put the weights on the scale and make an adjustment and take the weights off the scale and make another adjustment because just because the scale read zero and then when you put a thousand pounds on it, it read a thousand, you could put 500 pounds on it, it would weigh something totally different. And the only way to fix that is each individual section of the scale you know, zero, full, half, three quarters, one quarter, five eighths, wherever the, the indicator was around the dial, you had different adjustments you had to make. And it was it was a it was a weight lifting experience to get these things right. So you you learned really quick how to save time and save repetitions on lifting the fifty pound weights off the cart onto this. Well, we're talking about weights, and this comes to a story I want to tell you about. One of my first experiences at why I'm not a big fan of union labor. I used to have to, I shouldn't say have to, I used to have the privilege of going to General Motors Fisher Body Plant located up in Fairfield, Ohio. They used to stamp out auto bodies 
car parts, stamp out door panel, whatever. And then those parts would end up making their way to other plants around the country where they were building the cars, like the Norwood plant in Cincinnati that built the Camaros in 1977. Well, let me tell you a little experience I had with the unions there. I would drive a pickup truck, three-quarter ton, have a 1,000 pounds of weights in the back, my tools in the back, a cart in the back, and I would go through security and go to the loading dock, back up to the loading dock, and I was given instructions, you are not allowed to take anything off of your truck. You can move it to the tailgate. But our people, our union laborers, must take it off the tailgate and put it on the dock for you. Everything. So I would get in there every time I'd come to the, to the uh, Fisher Body plant up in Fairfield. I would get there and, hey, I'd wave to the guy and say, can you help me with my truck? He'd smile. And then ignore me. And he would be sitting on a chair with a piece of wood and a pocket knife. And he is whittling on a piece of wood, trying to turn it into some carved little animal or person or whatever he's carving that day into a piece of soft wood. And he's got this pile of shavings at his feet. And I'd say, hey, can you please uh, help me out, unload my truck? He said, we'll get to it. And he'd go back to whittling his little piece. So after a while, I realized the only way I gave him to do this was to get out of my truck and go hunt up a supervisor. They usually wore white shirts. You could tell who the boss was. And you'd explain that you're there to check out their scales and that you needed to get the guy at the loading dock to unload your truck, and you can't seem to get him to do it. He'd shake his head, and he'd walk with you back to the loading dock, and he'd say, hey, unload this guy's truck here. And the guy'd go, yes, sir. And he'd get up and he'd come over, and as long as that boss was standing there watching him, he would start unloading the truck. Well, about the first couple of times I did that, the boss said, okay, and the boss would leave. And now, you got to understand, this guy wasn't Speedy Gonzalez unloading the truck. He picked up the lightest load he could, one at a time, and unloaded it. And the second that boss turned around the corner, he got off the back of the truck, walked back over to his bench, and started whittling again. I'd have to go get a boss. Maybe not that boss. Maybe I'd lose him. I need a different boss. Boss come out. He finished up unloading the truck, and then I could do my scales. Well, this became a, you know, I used to do the scales there once a month. And every month, it was the same freaking shit. So I finally, you know, said, look, man. What is the story? Do you not like me or something? I can't get my truck unloaded? He says, no, it's nothing to do with you. He says, I've been here over 20 years. He says, I'm union. He says, if I show up to the job on time and I don't show up drunk, I sit here and I whittle my wood and I do absolutely nothing unless a boss comes and tells me to do it. At which point I say, yes, sir. And the second he turns his back, I go back to doing what I want to do. And there's not a freaking thing they can do about it. Of course, he used the F-U word, but he says they can't do a fucking thing about it because I've been here 20 years, and they can't do anything to me. So I come in, I put in my time, and I don't do shit. He says, you have to bid to get a job this good. You have to be here a while to get a job unloading trucks on the dock. He said, because you can't get away with this standing 
on a production line where they're pounding out metal. You bring the whole line to a stop. He says, here, nobody's watching. Only people you make mad is the truck drivers, and I don't care what they think. So, meanwhile, I'm looking out in the, in the parking lot. This is a General Motors plant. They make Chevrolets. They make Buicks. They make GMCs. They make GM cars. This is 1977, right after the big gas crisis. That lot was full of Nissans and Toyotas and Datsuns and little cars that came from Asia. They didn't buy Chevrolets because Chevrolets, I'll be honest, they didn't make the most fuel-efficient cars back in the day. The American automakers made gas-guzzling big old cars that didn't get good mileage. So the people who went and bought Toyota, they got better gas mileage going back and forth to work. But let me tell you something. When your attitude is, screw the company, all I want is my paycheck, and I don't care if I don't buy what they're building, you get what happened. Because somewhere in the next few years, back around the, the late 70s, like 79 or 80, if I remember correct, General Motors said, hell with it. We're shutting this plant down. We're going to have our parts manufactured at one of our other plants. And they closed that building. It stayed empty for the longest time. This building was freaking huge. I mean, it went for like a half a mile up Route 4. It was big, big place. They just said, screw it. And then later, they shut down the Norwood assembly plant that made Camaros and made Firebirds. They closed that one too because I did that plant, and it wasn't much better. The people were driving Toyotas. The attitude was, I'm going to do as little as I possibly can do to get my paycheck. And if nobody is standing over me, I say, yes, sir. And the second they turn their back, I just do what I want. I'm not here to bust my ass for the company. I'm here to get a paycheck at the end of the week. And I'm union, and there ain't a damn thing they can do to me. So that was my first experience and why I'm not a big fan of of labor unions in the United States. I understand that a lot of workers who work for big companies feel that labor unions protect them. But just like tenure for professors who don't teach, but instead would rather indoctrinate their students into Marxist, socialist, leftist, leaning, ideologies people in the union once they get their hooks in deep enough into the union seniority just say screw it i'm not working now i'm sure when they first came and got that job they were thankful for it they probably worked when they were the newbie until they got the experience with the union and i have one more union story for you but at the time, this is when I'm 22, when I was 17, I went to work while I was still in high school at a paper plant. And the union guys, I started out sweeping the floor. And then they, the bosses put me on running this machine. And the harder you would work and the more attention you would pay to this machine, the more output you could put out. And this goes to a food story, because what I was in charge of was taking five foot wide rolls of plastic Oreo cookie wrappers that wrapped those little packages of six Oreo cookies and a little plastic. That plastic's printed where it says Oreos all over it, and it's like five foot wide. And you put it through this machine that runs and cuts them down into individual pieces of plastic that can wrap the cookies in, into a wrapping machine. 
And the faster you run it, the more production you put out. Well, these guys were, in order to run it fast, you had to pay attention. You had to constantly be adjusting tensioners electronically and keeping certain pressures on the plastic. If you didn't, the plastic would bust and it would set you back an hour to reset up the machine. Well, I got good at it, and I started putting out three or four times what the union members who had seniorities were putting out. They were doing one five-foot roll a night, and I was doing three or four. Well, I got a stern warning from one of them that said, Hey, Kit, slow it the fuck down. You're doing it too fast. Don't run it over 10 RPM. Period. Well, I didn't listen to him because I was a kid. I was hard-headed. And I wanted to impress the boss. So I walked outside after a shift, after being there about a week. There was like five guys out there waiting for me by my car, wanting to kick my ass. Now, luckily for me, there was a guy that I'll be eternally grateful for. His name was Barry. And he worked there up at this paper company. It was called Cloudsley, Cloudsley Paper up in, well, I guess it was Forest Park in Cincinnati. This guy, Barry, he was built sort of like Mike Tyson. And evidently, I had heard that he was a very, very proficient amateur fighter. Now, I was 17. I was, you know, still in high school, and these guys were in their 30s, and there was like five or six of them. And I thought, boy, I, this isn't going to go good, you know. And they're shoving me around. They hadn't hit me yet. They were just shoving me, telling me, you know, you can't be working this hard. You can't be making us look bad shit. And it was escalating pretty quick. And then Barry came around the corner. And he was in the union too. But he came around the corner and said, hey, you know, you guys are pretty good. Five on one picking on this little kid. Why don't you take some of me? Who, want, who wants to take a little piece of me? You want to beat up on somebody? Let's look right here. And he was a badass, let me tell you. <laughs> this guy had this guy had biceps that looked sort of like, you know, Dwayne the Rock Johnson. You know, and he I heard later that he was like a golden gloves winner in boxing and you know, trained and they didn't want no part of him. None of them wanted any part of him. So he busted up the party. They left, and I got in my car and left. And I knew where the boss at that place lived because he had told me where he lived, and it was only like a block from where I was born on McGill Road. I drove over there the next morning. I told him, I said, I told him what happened. I told him why it happened. And I said, I quit. I said, I can't come back here. They're going to beat. They're going to beat my car in with a sledgehammer or cut my tires or they're going to beat me to death. And I said, unless I go in there and give you about 10 revolutions a minute and and just stall all night like these guys do. And I said, I, I'm not built that way. And see, I was young and thin and trim and weighed 185, 190 pounds at that time. When I was 17, and I was used to hard work. I had started out at a place called Aline Rents where they, you know, build tents and put up tents, take down tents. Got a lot of stories about that, but that's the reason why I'm not a big fan of unions in the United States. I sometimes think how much more productivity would the United States have had with meritocracy driving business. 
guy's good, you're promoting, you give him more money. If a guy's bad, you're firing. Well, you know, they can't fire anybody. Now, there used to be a guy who ran General Electric back in the day called Jack Welsh, and they called him Neutron Jack because his whole deal was we grade all the employees every year, and the bottom 10% we just fire. And we replace them. And they weren't union for the most part, the ones that he was grading anyway. And back then, GE was a powerhouse. GE was a profitable company. And you've got other companies and other employers who aren't union, like Tesla. And I'm sure from what I've read about Elon Musk that he believes in meritocracy. And I think that the world would be a better place if those who deserved it got promoted and got raises and those who didn't were shown the door. Now, I'm going to piss off a lot of union people on that. And if you're one of the ones who work hard and didn't lean on the union to say, I can't get fired, what the hell? Then I salute you. And if you weren't, I got no respect. Probably don't know it because if we don't come and watch you work, nobody knows it except your coworkers and your bosses. But it's held America back a great amount. Unions, for as much good as they've done, they've done just as much harm, in my opinion. I've never seen very much good experience with them. And that leads me to one of the companies in Cincinnati that I grew up around was Rumpke Trash. They pick up all the trash practically in Cincinnati, Indiana, Northern Kentucky. Huge. They come around, pick up your garbage cans. They go to industries and pick up their garbage. They're not union. Those men work. They start their shift four in the morning. They go out and they pick up their trash in the rain and the snow and the sleet and the ice. And they do a damn good job. And you know something? I lived four or five miles from that company. And I met a lot of people who worked for that company. They weren't union. And they were well paid. And everybody to a T said, you work hard here, you get a good paycheck. And they treat you good. If you don't, they get rid of you. That was an efficient company that printed money. Printed money. They weren't union. And your trash got picked up. Things got done. Just saying. So, in 1977, I weighed 190. And where did I go wrong? Stay tuned for the next episode and the next story. And we'll show you how it started going downhill from there. Thanks for watching. That's all, folks.